gentlemen. Anyone notice anything peculiar about Seaman First Class Urban? Polro, get him up. Trench? Oh, this is embarrassing. Yeah, sure is. Um, being a Gemini, I just never know what to expect. Hi, I'm Mark. And I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs. Love Kentucky Fried Movie. Yes. If you haven't seen Kentucky Fried Movie uh, from the makers of Airplane and the Naked Gun series. You're not going to see it on this channel before 10, that's no, for sure. No, it's, uh, it's Randy. It's probably the randiest mm -hmm. of the Zazz films. Oh, yeah, and no, I saw it um, before I was supposed to get in there. My dad uh, let me in, and then uh, we'll go into a little story. Why not? One of my best friends and I uh, went to see it. We were just laughing and laughing and laughing, and then at the end we turn around and my dad's sitting right behind ah. us. Like, Oops. Did he grab you by the by back like, of the collar and? There are like many female parts that shouldn't be there, and even male parts and stuff. So. It's uh, it's Randy. Yes. And it's available uh, DVD and Blu-ray, so it's out there. Not that there. we're pushing Kentucky Fried movies. I, I, well, it's very good. <laughs> I like it a lot. It's extremely funny. It really is. I, I'd rather funny. watch it than the Abrams, the guys before they did the airplane and all yes. that. Yes. So. And, yeah. and they're actually little jokes and little m minor right. characters that show up in Airplane. Yep. Um, we will talk about new movies this week. So there was a TV show uh, on last night. There was. Uh, I might, it might be the first time it's been produced. Uh, it, was, it had something to do with giving statues to, to movies and well, stuff? Yes, I think uh, um, Golden Guys. Did you watch that at all? I happen to. Did you have any uh, opinion overall on that? Uh, only one. Uh, I, there were always a few uh, when it comes out. It's been, I don't know how long. Uh, we're talking about the Oscars. Oh, yeah, that. Uh, obviously. Um, it's been, a, uh, I always enjoy it when there's one that I'll champion, something that I really want to see win. And it's been a while since I've seen that. There wasn't necessarily uh, anything uh, this year that I was really championing. Uh, and so then I'll defer or default to um, which ones are just the absolute giveaways. And I thought there were two, and they ended up being what I thought they would be. But there are always one, like, and, and one of them was Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour. Everybody said, you know, it's going to be Oldman. But, ooh, since Daniel Day-Lewis said it's his last one, uh, is he going to sneak in? So anyway, the only one that really surprised me, and not because I didn't think it was deserving, uh, was Allison Janney. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't heard anything about her, and I thought she's always very good. But I just uh, expected Lady Bird to take uh, a couple of those that I didn't. I, um, I enjoyed the program. I always do. It is my Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I don't have any stakes in it. I don't really care about who does and doesn't win. I don't get offended that things I liked are not in there. Right. People, so, a lot of people get mad that, you know, how come the movies that made $400 billion don't get Oscars? <laughs> they got rewards. And they should be happy enough. <laughs> little pieces of paper with old men with beards on them. Uh, <laughs> I always try to say, you know, when people get all uppity about the Oscars, it's like, this is a private industry function that happens to be commercial enough to put on TV. Right. And so many people get mad and get, and get offended about it or get arrogant about not watching it and all that. And I'm just like, you don't, you don't really have to watch the Oscars. To me, it's cool to see a shot at the Oscars and the Golden Globes of somebody sitting down and you can spot like 10 famous people behind him in the, in, in, in the right. audience. That's always kind of fun. Yeah. I think it's generally pretty funny. And it's a, an evening dedicated to that, which I like. Maybe not the favorite movies of mine from the year, but it's fun to see you know two hours of primetime dedicated to what I choose to spend my time on. Right, you mentioned about it being funny. Um, I think some of it was too long. I was surprised. I, I, I'm not familiar with uh, Jimmy Kimmel. I thought he was really good and funny. Yes. Um, I grew up, of course, with Carson, and I was expecting that, and then Billy Crystal took it for a while. And so it's interesting to see these different people taking it along, but yeah, I thought Kimmel was really pretty clever. So speaking of the first film we had to talk about this week. Yes. It, should we? We should. We've been talking about enough. May I? Other things. Go right ahead. Okay, I didn't see this. This will be great. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence returns to the action adventure milieu, page a day calendar, vocabulary builder, as a young Russian woman in scripted enlisted to become a secret agent, code name Red Sparrow. <laughs> So, uh, okay, I'll take Sorry. over. I'll, I'll take this over. Um, very, very long. Uh, if you, as you see on the ads, 
uh, it's always talking about how, and, and they may have, uh, with that trailer, we may have seen that, ooh, big surprise ending, and you'll never guess what's going to happen. Um, I thought this, this ran right at two, uh, two and a half hours long. I thought you easily could have trimmed half an hour, maybe even 45 minutes from it. Um, Joel Edgerton is, uh, is very good as a CIA agent who um, obviously tries to turn her over uh, and to work for us. Uh, the whole story is that she's a ballerina, uh, there's this horrible accident, and uh, she can't dance anymore. Uh, her mother is ill, and she'd been, uh, uh, her mother had been being taken care of by Bolshoi Medical or something, I guess. And so since she can't dance anymore, what are they going to do with her mother? So um, the uh, KGB offers her this opportunity, hey, become a spy for us. So she goes through this uh, Sparrow training. Um, You'd called her uh, uh, her code name Red Sparrow. As I recall, I never heard the term Red Sparrow. I'm always waiting to clap. Well, I guess if I she's forget. communist, you could say that's right. You know, red, so that whatever. must have been it. Yeah. Uh, sparrows uh, are these females who are trained to use everything imaginable, primarily sex, uh, to try to get there. So it, it's this constant, you know, twisting around of: Is she really working for the Soviets? Is uh, she going to help? Joel Edgerton, oh, she's doing this to Joel Edgerton. Does that, uh, what exactly is going on? Um, I thought it was slow and boring, um, <laughs> as did uh, my younger son. He thought it was confusing. Um, they, they wrap it up. It's very much uh, almost like a courtroom drama at the end where they come in and they say, well, you know, Your Honor, and then they rant off everything. This was very much yeah. where they, we get together. Jeremy Irons is in this as uh, kind of pretty much the head of the KGB. And so there's a scene where, toward the end, where she and Irons meet, and they're just kind of summarizing everything for us as if we didn't remember it. So yeah, I was kind of unimpressed with this. I was went in expecting uh, a sort of Clancy-esque uh, thinker's movie. I wasn't expecting this to be Bond with lots of action, but there was really very little action, and I was not terribly impressed with Red Sparrow. Did you have a desire for termination while watching this film? Well, as, uh, perhaps as you're watching this, he's... Uh, sliding on through there. We could talk about Bruce Willis's new movie, uh, which actually we will. Um, Bruce plays a family man. Those of you who are fans of Charles Bronson from the 70s uh, might remember this story uh, going on, but Bruce plays a family man uh, whose uh, family, the family, is attacked by a bunch of robbers. And uh, what are you going to do with these police? They're just of no help. Well, one of my comments would probably be that if you're going to attack Bruce Willis uh, and try to get away with it, you must have some sort of death wish. So, um, I love Bruce. Uh, I, I'll admit to liking uh, vigilante movies and just uh, all I need to see is Bruce uh, beating up a bunch of people, um, reminiscent of Die Hard or something like that. Uh, it, Again, there's something, I, I don't like violence just for violence's sake, but usually, and I respect him enough, uh, and he's certainly got enough star power, that it's not going to be that. It's going to be presenting some bad people who need to get their just desserts. Um, now, uh, I did not see this yet. I, want, uh, I wanted to. It's not local, strangely enough. I'm not sure how kind of, what kind of wide distribution this is going to get. Uh, it surprised me that, um, uh, that uh, Latches didn't get it. I don't think even Keen Cinema's got it. So it's a surprising limited release. Maybe we'll see it spread out a little bit more afterwards. But I think you got to figure pretty much what you see is what you get. It's going to be Bruce finding uh, as clever a way as possible to kill as many people as possible and giving us some uh, silly death lines. With any revenge film, I always wish it's like a football team or like an entire huge amount of people who are in on the conspiracy who have to get avenged oh, right. because well, I've seen other vigilante revenge films where it's like three guys and it's like well that's only three brutal deaths I get to enjoy mm -hmm. why can't it be 40 people that he exactly has to work right, his way yeah. through uh, I didn't see it either because it's not local so uh, we uh, really have nothing much to say other than uh, first Death Wish Charles Bronson 1974 yep. solid movie Death Wish 2 crazy sleazy yes. a lot of fun yeah. uh, they made two more after that that, or maybe even three yeah, that I, I didn't see 
I remember seeing Death Wish 4, and it was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I actually have a Blu-ray set from Umbrella Entertainment in Australia that's Death Wish 2 and 3 together with like a, a director's cut and all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay. Uh, a movie called Death Sentence with Kevin Bacon was another take on the source material book that was done in the early 2000s, I believe. Didn't know that. So this story's been done a couple times, and there have been a million revenge movies oh, yeah, beyond that. Sure. So um, if you can't get out to the theater to see Bruce Willis killing people in this film, there are plenty of other movies well, where you can see Bruce Willis. All you have to do is turn on CNN, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, well, this so. film was originally supposed to be released a while ago. Yes. And then the Vegas shooting happened, and they were like, maybe this isn't the right environment yeah. for this. Let's wait until right. everything has calmed down. So they set a release date, and then Florida happened. Yeah, and honestly, uh, if you're going to wait until there aren't mass shootings to put this movie out, this movie may never get released. So right. it's out now. Yeah. Uh, that's all that we have to discuss in theaters currently. Yep. We thank our friends at the Latches Theater in Brattleboro, Vermont, for sponsoring this program. And now we move on to that which you can watch on the home video platform device <laughs> service or format we'll of your out a choice. Quick way to say that eventually. <laughs> on a on screen. video. It yeah. says on yeah. video. So. Pa your, your pantsless viewing options for this week. Uh, so now this is a film I also didn't see, but uh, may I? You should. May I? Okay, great. Since you didn't see it. The Oscar nominated and winning film that we are about to discuss features Gary Oldman as uh, an old man, uh, Winston Churchill dealing with uh, Nazis, fighting Nazis, two fisted Winston Churchill fighting Nazis in the London of the past. And will this be their darkest hour? Five, four, three, two, one, blast off! So, um, we're back. Sorry. Yes. Space and out. Um, multiple Academy Awards. I believe that one for makeup, but yes. Oldman definitely won. Oldman is, uh, and, and uh, as I said at the beginning, this was the one. Even uh, after, right after I saw this, I came out thinking because the Academy loves um, uh, performances. Uh, about uh, the past, about famous figures and things like that. So when I left, I said, you know, Oldman's going to win for that. Uh, he was absolutely terrific. It's clearly his film. Um, it doesn't deal, what, what surprised me uh, was that it doesn't deal a lot with the war. It's the build up to the war. It's all the things that Churchill um, had to do, and we got a real good, interesting look at what it's like to uh, be the one in power and to have to make these decisions. Um, I thought he was spectacular. Um, it's a little bit long, again, I think, and uh, I'm sounding old because everything I'm saying lately... I feel like most movies are too these long. These movies are too long. Um, but he's unquestionably worth it, and um, this is, again, obviously, uh, out on video. Uh, it was a, really a terrific film. Did it feature any outdoor advertising? I mean, um, I'm a fan of old-style advertising in films. I didn't know if it had that at all. Nothing uh, quite like that. Oh. I don't know where to go with this, so I'm just going to jump right in and say, speaking of Academy Awards, um, another Academy Award winner, multiple Academy Awards uh, here, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, um, Frances McDormand won uh, the gold. Uh, she took Oscar home uh, for portraying a woman whose daughter is brutally murdered. And the local police, Woody Harrelson, and Academy Award winner Sam Rockwell, just don't seem to be doing a whole lot about it. What are you going to do when uh, you can't get the police riled up in order to do the right things? Well, maybe you should take out three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. They've left their fields and barns. They're marching from the farms because kids don't drink enough milk. Oh, Hi. And we're back. So, um, Oscar-winning film? Yes. Um, Deservedly so. Yes, this I was, think this is good. This has been at Keen Cinemas locally here for a long time. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying earlier, it's it's funny. Um, Chad has all these films, and he got a lot of them. Like I had seen this at the Alamo; it had been out a while. And a while later, it came to Keen Cinemas. But then it gets nominated for Golden Globes, and it becomes of interest again. Right. And then it goes down, and it wins Golden Globes, mm -hmm. and, it goes, and now it's nominated for Oscars. So it's still there. Um, it's not the comedy that some of the trailers make you right. think it might be. It, um, and we often talk about. Uh, oh, did you enjoy that movie? Don't know. Uh, although it ends on a surprisingly upbeat note. That, that's one of the things that Yeah, kind of upbeat me. and a little open. Yes. Like, it almost feels like there could be a sequel to this movie, yeah. if you recall where it ends. Uh, and the sequel might look a little like Death Wish. <laughs> um, so McDormand is great. She is yes. front and center. She is She's the core of this good. movie. As in a no-nonsense, foul-mouthed, upset mother of a murdered young girl and feels she feels like the police department in the city is either covering up or just not doing anything to to find the killer so she puts up these billboards that basically call them out on it and it causes all this strife amongst this people in this small town 
Uh, Woody Harrelson is the sheriff. Sam Rockwell is the deputy. Both of them and, are so terrific. And everybody in this is quite good. Um, it's a pretty sad movie overall. Right. At its core, it's about somebody's child who was murdered, and she's trying to deal with this. So there are the moments you see in the trailer that are amusing, but it's mostly those. There's a little bit more. But otherwise, it's a lot of ugliness and a lot of... Uh, unhappy people and anger and racism and hatred and all kinds of stuff. E even to the point game. where it's uncomfortable watching it. Yes. But that's the point. But yeah, I, again, it's uh, it's not one of these movies that I say uh, I can say I enjoy. Hey, let's watch Three Billboards again. You know, I don't know. Uh, Peter Dinklage is in this, mm -hmm. who I like. He's and always fun. It's great that they make, I mean, he's, he's not a tall man, and they make some <laughs> references to his height in the film, but otherwise, he's just a guy, and yeah. they don't play it for anything other than he's just this guy and he happens to not be very tall, which I, I, I kind of like that. So yeah, I thought this was really good. Uh, just make sure that it's, uh, you know it's not a comedy going into it. Right. But it's, uh, it's worth sure watching. Make sure the little kids are in bed. Yes. And, and have earplugs because the language is colorful. Yes. Um, so speaking of colorful, yes. this is actually a legit segue. It's, there you uh, go. Speaking of Oscar winning, here's <laughs> a film that won uh, Best Animated Feature last night, and somebody in this room may actually know the person who directed it. And Best Song. And Best Song, which yeah. I, of all the songs, I, well, between that and the great, uh, great, uh, Greatest Showman, I thought that was a pretty good song. Yes, yeah. Uh, we have the tale of what happens when you go, when you break on through to the other side, literally, <laughs> and uh, meet your dead relatives and try to get back alive, and it all revolves around someone named Coco. Get hold of And we're back again. Uh, I saw this in the theater. I saw, yep, a little, as did I, I. I saw it after you reviewed it on the show. Uh, I thought this was really good. And I, I'm not a fan of kids' movies, so I'm hesitant to you know, willingly watch them. But um, for anybody who ever has had an older relative who is no longer with us, this speaks directly to you. And it, oh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a crying movie, folks. It is, it, it's a crying movie. Uh, it is gorgeous to look at. I feel bad for anybody who yeah. hasn't seen this on the big screen. I think this might still be at Keen Cinemas, and I would strongly recommend people see it there, if it's still there, because there's so much detail. When the, basically, the story is a little boy um, finds a way to cross over to the... It's, it's based on the Mexican Day of the Dead right, and, and the Mexican dead. you know, uh, afterlife... Uh, I hate to say mythology, but their beliefs. And he goes on this day where they, the dead sort of cross back and forth to visit the, the living they left behind. He goes the opposite direction and basically wants to find his great grandfather or his grandfather who he believes was this, you know, singing cowboy in Mexican movies and uh, has to try to find a way to come back or else he's going to be basically dead forever. And there's some intrigue and there's some drama and there's some other stuff. Uh, it, it is The visuals are all based on that culture and they're gorgeous. Yeah. The color is blazingly gorgeous. And the big screen aspect of it is in, in this world, there are all these little things in the sky and little mm -hmm. villages and, and houses. And there's so much detail there. You feel like you could zoom in on that and just see all the stuff they put right. in there. So it, obviously it'll still look great on TV, but on the big screen you can really kind of get lost in this movie. The music is really good. Mm -hmm. An Oscar winning song, which I thought deserved it. And uh, it, it's, it's, it kind of sticks with you for a while afterwards. I, I really like this quite a bit. And it's, I think kids can certainly get into it on the visuals. And I think this is the ideal movie when we say, you know, a kid's movie versus a family movie. This will speak to adults on a level that kids will not understand for right. a long time. Yeah. And it's not because it's making goo jokes or pop culture references or drug and alcohol humor. It's because it's talking about experiences that you have as you grow older right. that you don't have when you're a kid. But as you opened with, it, uh, it deals with... Uh, situations that the that kids can relate to as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've always said that movies and art, and I, I firmly believe that movies are uh, art, perhaps the culmination uh, of the, the the pinnacle of art, the art form yet. But um, I think art teaches us how to deal with the human condition. And you're right that I think this works on both levels. Take your kids to see it, uh, and it uh, t tells you how to deal with the loss of loved ones and keeping a family unified. Uh, it also does, I think, a great job, and I'm, um, uh, the people who were on uh, the Oscars last night alluded to this, uh, opening up uh, the Hispanic and Mexican heritage to the world uh, and, and kind of showing how we're all the same, but here's a unique uh, little look at it as well. Um, uh, yeah, I like Coco even more the second time once I was familiar with it. And as you said, with Pixar, you're always going to get um, just beautiful, gorgeous imagery. Right. Um, so now we move to uh, my favorite part of the show, which is the Arrow Video Corner. 
Um, we have uh, three films to talk about. Well, I should say three releases to talk about. Yes. But they are films that, oh, wow, that's in an area that might really uh, do you some more serious damage. Uh, that's right. Damage. I got a bad knee. Don't uh, do it. Oh, uh, here it comes. Where is it? Huh? Catch. Or maybe not. Uh, there, there it is. Go. Oh, right in the bread basket the this paper. time. Wow. No, I, I think it got you. Uh, <laughs> he, he may bleed out before the show's over. So uh, first up, speaking of family bonds. Yes. There was, a, there was a movie a while back uh, with Greg Kinnear and Matt Damon, and they were conjoined <laughs> twins. Um, take that under the, the dark side. Turn it over and imagine uh, some Siamese twins who are, are taken to the doctor to be separated. Um, and uh, things kind of don't go quite, quite so well. Um, one of the surviving brothers is out to make sure that his brother uh, gets some just desserts on these doctors. Um, the doctors and all of those medical physicians are really going to be kind of a basket case. Any place to eat? Are you getting hungry? I'm starved. I remember this from the theaters. You saw this in the theater? Yeah. Oh, that, oh yeah. I, I have subsequently. Uh, so this is one I remember seeing, I think, on USA Up All Night or, or something like that back in the later 80s. This is uh, from 82. Frank Henenlotter directed it, who went on to do... Uh, Frankenhooker and uh, Brain Damage and a right. lot of other stuff that's a lot of fun and sleazy. Set in the grimy New York of the early 80s, this guy's young guy is carrying a basket around, and as, as they say, what's in the basket? Well, what's in the basket is this weird deformed, it looks like a Frankenstein head with a couple little arms <laughs> with pointy teeth who eats and grabs and shreds and kills people. And the story is he was, they were a pair of Siamese conjoined twins that doctors forcibly separated. So these, this guy and his brother in the basket are mm -hmm. now going around to find all the doctors and the medical team who did that and kill them one by one. Um, it is done straight faced, but with a lot of humor. Right. It's pretty ridiculous. It's gory. It's silly. It's grimy. It's if people are fond for some reason of the dirty, sleazy New York City, this is, it was shot there. Mm -hmm. um, the arrow transfer looks great. As great as this movie is going to look because it was shot cheap. Right. I mean, it's presented four by three because it was shot probably on 16, I would think. And uh, you get, what do you want to call it, archive special features that were done for previous releases because oh, okay. this has had special editions before this. So they poured over you know, a commentary with the cast and crew. I think there's a new Frank Henenlotter commentary. There's an interview, or they call it weird interview with Frank Henenlotter, which is essentially a naked man who's not Frank Henenlotter okay. answering questions ridiculously while Henenlotter asks them to him. There are uh, a tour of the locations. I mean, this is loaded with extras. Like, the extras here are presented as a scrolling thing that you go down, and it's like four pages of, of stuff you go mm. down. So I watched, uh, uh, to be honest, I've seen the movie a bunch of times, so I watched some of the movie to see that the transfer looks and sounds as, as good as it ever has to my eyes and ears. The uh, extras are voluminous. I got through some of them. I will get through all of them eventually, but it's not all there. So who is this movie for? Maniacs. This movie yeah. is for people who don't, who like weird, sleazy, gory, goofy movies. Uh, it's not for anybody who probably watched the Oscars last night. Not for anybody whose, pref whose preference in film is that which the Oscars celebrate, let's say. You can like both. I do. But, um, so it's fun. If you've bought Basket Case before, if you know Arrow Video, you know that it's worth an upgrade because this will hopefully be the last version of Basket Case you ever need to buy. There's one feature I did not watch that's advertised as Basket Case 3.5. So it might be a little bit of an addition or sequel mm -hmm. to Lauder Shot. Um, I know the the copies that we get of this are a clear slim DVD case and a plain right. white disc. So the contents on the disc are the same, but the packaging is not. My understanding is this is crazy deluxe packaging too. Like it opens up and there's books and posters and postcards and all kinds of crazy. And the packaging is made to look like a basket with a movie logo right. on it. So it, it's pretty cool. Basket case is now out in stores. Um, if I may. It's your turn. Oh, hey. This is a film I'd never heard of until like a week ago. Um, Robert Lansing stars as a plastic surgeon in the South who will go to great lengths to make sure he gets an inheritance that the person who died doesn't think he deserves. And he uses, among other things, a scalpel. You can reach it quickly, comfortably, and with utmost economy. He was Gary Seven in Star Trek. He was a guy that I mm -hmm. recognized. I think he was in the 4D Man. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Old sci-fi movie. Yeah. Um, I recognize him from one of those guys who was just on TV a lot right. in, in old yeah, you'd shows when I was a kid. In the 60s and 70s. Well-dressed. 
Uh, so I'd never heard of this until Arrow announced it. And when they announced it, I'm like, so it's either an Italian horror movie or it's one of those newer movies they put out once in a while, but I just don't know what this is. So I popped it in totally blind mm -hmm. and it worked so well that way. Like, I'm glad we didn't use the actual trailer because the trailer gives away so many plot points. Okay. And this, I almost think of a movie called Red, Walk, Red Rock West that I liked a yeah. lot, yeah. which was kind of a neo-noir and it kept taking these hard right turns and you'd be like, whoa, I didn't yeah. see that coming. And I was like exclaiming out loud. I, I felt like Kenneth, Kenneth Williams in a Carry On movie. I kept going, ooh, <laughs> while I'm watching this movie because these things that happen to the characters, you're like, how is this gonna play now? So the basic premise, and I'm not gonna say much because it's really worth trying to find this. Robert Lansing is a, a, a not a nice man and he is a, a plastic surgeon in the South. His father-in-law dies. Robert Lansing's wife has died in the past. The father-in-law says explicitly, I'm not gonna give you any money to Robert Lansing in his will. I'm gonna give it to your daughter because she's lovely and she deserves it, but I think you did my wife wrong and what, I think you did your wife wrong and whatever. So Robert Lansing's daughter uh, disappears after he does something she doesn't quite like. She just leaves and he's driving somewhere and he, sort of in front of his car drops a woman with a, a scarred face and he decides he's gonna use his plastic surgery skills to make her look like his daughter who isn't around anymore so that he can work oh, with okay. her to get this inheritance and that that's just the setup <laughs> things keep happening where you're like whoa what's gonna happen now and it's it was really good now i thought this was going to be from the title and from the brief flash you see in that arrow video story I thought this was going to be gory, right, like a lot of eyes without a face, where they really dwell on the plastic surgery. They don't. It's one scene. It's very brief. It's you could almost probably could show worse on TV now. Certainly, Walking Dead does. It's really this perverse Southern Gothic mm -hmm. drama noir about this really nasty guy and you how seem he's trying to. to enjoy it so much. I really, I really <laughs> liked this. I've been telling everybody about how much I like this movie, and it might just be because I've never heard of it, right. and and it surprised me, which most movies don't. And he's just so nasty. He's, mm -hmm. He doesn't lose his temper. He just is manipulating everyone around him to get this money that he wants. And it was, oh, it was, it was deliciously dark. Oh, I good. really like this a lot. It has a, a little interview, has an introduction by the director, who's not a young man anymore. It has an interview with the director about how the whole project came to be. I believe, I didn't watch all the extras, I believe it has an interview with the cinematographer. And there's an interesting point we'll get back to on that. Um, it's got the trailer, which gives away way too much. And... Uh, Maybe something else. Okay, this release did something I've never seen Arrow do before. They say at the beginning, and one of the things I like about Arrow releases too, when you click on an extra, there's usually a little sentence or two explaining what you're about to see okay. for context. So you click on the movie to play and it says choose one of two versions. Oh, there's great. the original color grading. So the original cinematographer said this was what this movie should look like, which is a little darker and very yellowish dark tones because it's you know hot, humid, summer, southern gothic. Or there's the Arrow video color grading, which is what they think looks really good. So you can pick one or the other, and they do make it, give it a totally different visual look, but you can also toggle between the two while you're watching it. Hmm. So while I was watching it, there'd be a sort of a scene that was kind of dark, and I would hit it, and the Arrow video version was like bright and colorful, and it looked like it was shot yesterday. And then you click back to the other, and it's, it's much darker and moodier. So I know, you know alternate angle was often a thing on DVDs, but it was never used that much. Right. This is the first time I can think of where you can pretty much switch back and forth between two different looks for a movie while you're watching it. And you would think that would make the bit rate suffer and the movie wouldn't look as good because right. you're cramming two versions of a, not at all, it looks fantastic. Good. So highly recommend Scalpel uh, out now from Arrow. Um, one more to talk yes. about. This I may need to refer to notes on when I start talking about it properly. Uh, here we have a box set of, I'm going to look down on occasion, um, the, I'll give the title last. Here's a box set of rarely oh. seen by anybody, uh, Jean-Luc Godard films that were made in the late 60s, early 70s, when he sort of embraced political radicalism and started using these films he was making as a way to get these radical communist left-wing ideals out into the cinemas as sort of like a regular... Um, regular manifestos, like he's talking about things that were happening or had just happened and, and where the country was going and all that. Uh, the, the set is entitled, and I'm going to read this because I'm not that smart, Jean-Luc Godard and Jean-Pierre Gorin, five films, 1968 to 1971. And then I remember that we don't have a trailer for this. That's true. So I'll start talking to you and they'll okay. run a super. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, I'm going to speak in general terms about these films. So I haven't seen a lot of Godard. 
I've always Everybody been, thinks of Weekend. Weekend so. is the one I have seen. I right. might have seen another. I saw the film at the Alamo recently that he did just a few years ago that was a 3D film he made. And I didn't really like it, but I liked that he was playing with the medium and doing something I'd never seen in, in film before with right. just how it works and structure. And I guess that's always been a thing for him. And that's what he did in these films, too. Uh, I'm not going to read the titles because I don't remember them, but I remember my experience of seeing them. Um, so anybody who thinks we just kiss Arrow's butt and like everything because they give us these free discs and we want to keep them coming, um, this this review will prove that wrong. Uh, okay, I didn't. I, this was this was not for me. Okay, I posted on Facebook to my friends. I'm like, I think I might be too dumb to get Godard because <laughs> these films are so hard to access, inaccessible. Maybe I don't know. I know people who like them a lot, but these are films that were of a specific time and place. And I feel like unless you are well versed in these cir the circumstances these were made in, they're hard to get anything out well, of. Well, he was almost a precursor to the French New Wave, too. So uh, he, he, even early on, starting weird stuff going on. Yeah, he's, he was always odd, and I expected yeah. that. But these are sort of documentaries. They kind of are documentaries. They're, okay. they're manifesto movies, really. Uh, the first one is... From a distance, you never see anybody's face. A group of youths in, a, in, in the tall grass outside an apartment building somewhere in France talking about their political ideals and theories and manifestos and proclamations while they intercut with newsreel footage of like student riots or worker protests that had like just gone on. And they talk nonstop, so you're reading the subtitles and you're trying to keep up with what they're talking about and you're trying to process what they're talking about in all of these obtuse theoretical proletariat, bourgeoisie, all this kind of stuff, while at the same time there are like radio news reports playing under that that are not translated. Okay. And you know if you understood the language, you'd be getting this really interesting right. two, two di dialogue tracks, but not speaking French, I'm not getting any of it. And not understanding what they're talking about, I'm just lost. So m two of the films out of the five are only about an hour long. Um, the other three are 80, 90 minutes. They're not terribly long, but I don't think I made it all the way through any of them. I gave them all a chance. Uh, but I just couldn't get into it because I didn't know what they were talking about. And my right. tolerance for people espousing their philosophies about anything political right. on any side of the, of the fence, I tire of after a while. Right. And this is five films worth of that. Mm -hmm. um, another one is set in a, it talks about things that were going on in England with workers and student strikes and Vietnam protests and all that, while you see footage from a British automotive factory. And that was interesting in, life, in just in that, well, that's what a British auto factory in 1968 looks like. But it was more of the same. Um, it's they're I don't know I, I hate to call them pretentious they're just very they were made for people of that time who were I think in, in interested in all these political movements and if you don't have any context for them I found them intolerable to sit through <laughs> um, he does play with form and he plays with structure and he plays with what a movie can be and that's kind of interesting but having to you know, and I'm not anti-subtitles by any means. I, if a good movie is a good movie, I don't care what it takes for me to experience it. Right. But I know you've said in other people, if your eye is constantly focused on that sliver at the bottom of the screen the whole time and people are constantly talking in a film, it's hard to look up enough right. to get what else is going on. And that's part of the problem here. I almost wish there was a dubbed version of these so I could focus more on the visuals while my ears were doing the other work. And a lot of the other films do do the same thing where you're seeing... Newspaper headlines while somebody's talking, and only one of those things are translated, right, that's all you or two uh, dialogue streams that aren't translated. Um, there is, a, as far as extras go, and I almost wished I would have watched this first, there's a long-form interview with a man who's a scholar about all this, and he gives you a lot of the context for what was going on at the time with Godard and, the, and, and Gorin, who he's, he was working with, and these historical events and all that. If I had heard that first... I don't know that I would have gotten any more out of these films, ultimately. <laughs> like, the, okay. your other Arrow has put out, Arrow Academy has some historical pieces about, there was Ludwig, and there was the right. one about the re unification of Italy and all that. And that I kind of picked up as I went along. And there, was, there were little uh, essays on there that gave you the background. But this, I just, I couldn't handle this. <laughs> um, I didn't watch a lot of it, ultimately. I watched enough to comment on it. Um, there's a two-hour and ten-minute Godard interview that if you're into him, that's two hours with Godard you get to spend. Right. There's an aftershave commercial he made <laughs> in for the late 60s, early 70s for French TV. That's very Godard. <laughs> you watch it, and by the end, you're like, was that real? Did they actually put that on TV? Because it's not much about much of anything. Eventually, the guy uses an aftershave or a razor, and I guess, okay, well. Um, so I commend Arrow on putting this out, though. 
because if you're into this, this was stuff that was never available before. And it's a great set for this period of this filmmaker's life if you're really interested in that. I think it's really only going to appeal to people who are into Godard, who are into that period of history. As, as a document of that time and place, that's pretty invaluable, I think. Or if you're into strange avant-garde art film, <laughs> it is probably worth it. Right. But if you like, if you like Arrow for all the other stuff they put out, this is probably not for you. <laughs> it was really not for me. Um, and that's all we have yep. on our list this week with 12 minutes to spare. It's amazing. How we do it, I don't, don't know. know. Um, so uh, next week, Wrinkle in Time. Wrinkle in Time, yep. We know we'll be seeing that. Uh, the Strangers, which is like a sequel Have or we... a remake of a previous sort of horror film. Okay. Um, I don't know much about it. I kind of expect that won't be playing locally. Right. Uh, Hurri the Hurricane, Hurricane Heist. Heist. I mean... saw a commercial for that and I said, wow, that's a really fun idea. And then I'm like, and it's horrendously fake CGI yeah. and ridiculous and then, hanging off a truck in a tornado <laughs> as it goes up the funnel kind of action. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I care about Hurricane Heist. Uh, what was that movie, uh, Hard Rain, the, the um, yes. Christian Slater right. movie in the 90s that was about, a, I think, a bank heist during like a hurricane or something right. like that? I would probably rather see something like that. <laughs> but if we have the ability, I will see it and we will talk about it. We'll find out. Um, so shall we? We should, I okay. guess. Uh, until next week, Time I'm Mark. To. And I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs.